one where we've learned how, we've got a nerdy guide we've also had ones about remix we've had uh, ones all about different about performance and all about different things and now what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little different we are actually going to have a panel so i'm going to invite my co mc to onto the stage and and let's chat a little bit because you're a software developer as well what's your day job like yeah it involves building a lot of integrations and in turn, reading a lot of documentation. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was going to kind of lead us on to because one thing which is a part of a developer's life on a day-to-day -day basis is documentation, whether you're reading it, writing it, uh, or just interacting with it in general. Uh, I just would like to get a feel for the room. The, who here works on documentation in some way, shape, or form? This is good, all right? This is really, really good. Well. Look, we all want to get better at writing code, and I think as well that sometimes writing good documentation helps you write better code, but who better to help us get some advice on how we can improve our docs and maybe how some people who are not involved in docs at all can. So I am going to invite, and I'd like you to give a big round of applause, our panelists of wonderful experts to the stage to come and join us for this panel. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Make yourself comfortable. Make yourself comfortable. Now, I also do want to remind you all as well, wherever you are, uh, grab your phone out because this will also have some audience participation. So we have a couple of questions lined up that we're going to ask them. But we would like maybe if one of the speakers says something and you'd like them to follow up, you want to find out a bit more, what you can do is if you grab your phone out, uh, just so that I can keep track of who's asking questions when, and go onto the Discord, okay? And on the talk track on the channel that is for this talk, go into the Discord and type your question. And one thing I'd like to ask as well is when you type your question, can you just write in person or online in front of your question? If you are in person, then when it gets to you, I'm going to read out your username and say, this person has asked a question. Would you like to stand up and read it? And then I get to do the really fun thing of chucking you this microphone that you just hold and read. So you're just going to hold and say your question, and then hopefully someone in our panel will answer it. I'm going to allow us that if you have a question, if you're in person, you're going to get one follow-up. So if just maybe the person didn't necessarily answer the question, like the, maybe you want to re-explain the question, you get one follow-up as well. So does that make sense? So remember, if you want to ask a question, Go onto the Discord. If you are online, don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you. When your question comes in, we will read it out for the panel to also be involved. All right, let's jump in to documentation. But before that, we need to meet our panel of experts. Why don't we go along and have you all introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, I'm, is this on? Yeah. OK, uh, I'm Nat Allison. Uh, I help the React team work on their, the internationalization of their documents. I also made the little weird animation on the React Native website, uh, if any of you remember that. So yeah. I have a mic. Um, I'm Ilion. I work on the developer experience team at Astro, uh, where my main responsibility is community contributions and, of course, documentation. I'm Achla, and I work, in, uh, uh, I work at Crab Nebula as a DevRel engineer. And I have some experience writing quite a lot of content, uh, art, uh, technical content. And yeah, working with teaching developers in many sorts of uh, experience levels. I'm Tejas Kumar. Is this on? I'm Tejas Kumar. I've been an engineer for many, many years. And in that, um, has have had a lot of docs writing experience. And today, I run a small agency that helps a number of dev tools companies reach developers. And a lot of that is done through high quality writing, particularly in docs. I'm Rachel Neighbors. Uh, you might remember me from such projects as reactnative.dev and the uh, Web Animations API docs on MDN. I uh, lead developer education at, at Clerk. Awesome. Such an amazing panel. So we have a lot to talk about. Why don't we get started? Yeah, so we've got a big mix of people that will be, uh, have different experience interacting with documentation. And so I'd like to start with the question of what does a good documentation experience look like? 
Well, well, I, I actually have a question for the audience. I saw some hands up for people who write documentation, but I'm curious, could we see a show of hands for how many people use documentation? <laughs> okay, okay. And how many of you uh, use videos in your day-to-day? -day? In your day-to-day? -day? Use YouTube videos. Okay, okay. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, good documentation. Uh, in an ideal world, my vision of documentation is that it's a human API, transporting knowledge from one engineer's mind into another engineer's mind. Now, if we could make that instantaneous, like if we had a RAID copying information from the React core team into all of you, we'd all be amazing 10x engineers. But that's just not possible. Documentation has to reformat information and pass it on to the next generation so that they can do good work. So uh, good documentation is how quickly you can take one engineer with no context to being a fully functioning, high-performing engineer who understands the, their, uh, their topic inside and out. Anyone else have anything to add on like, what a good documentation experience just entails? Um, I think in addition to that, it's also important that um, a documentation can cater for different kinds of usage. So there will be people that are going to be um, quite new to some kind of uh, API or something like that. They were going to explore the documentation for a long time, but there's also the situation where we got stuck at some point, and then we reach out to the docs, and we want to get in, get our answer, and get out. And then a, doc a good documentation in this case is something that can do what Rachel just mentioned, transferring the knowledge to somebody that's in need to that, but needs to do it fast in a way that um, uh, minimize the context switch. So. Um, yeah. I think I've seen practically three things that make documentation shine to me and, and that really take it to the next level. One of them is if it's an API, um, oftentimes you consume them with different languages. And so a lot of great docs websites have code snippets and you can choose your language, JavaScript, TypeScript, Go. And when you choose it in one place, it just propagates through the rest of the docs. I think that's brilliant. Second thing is um, if it's an API that you're documenting, like Clerk or other products, um, the, the ability to run a, a request inside the docs and, and really make the docs interactive, I think, is valuable. And then finally, um, we did this. At, well, I worked at Spotify for a while, and we had um, a big team dedicated to internal docs called Golden Paths. And there, in the docs, any engineer could highlight text, select it, and you get a little context menu that, with a little button that says, I don't understand this. And you click that button, it opens a GitHub issue for the docs team, and we clarify it with that text and with the context. So those three things have, have been really helpful for high quality docs um, from, from past experience. I think one of the, the main things that I also find important if I use documentation is searchability and indexability. So you can just search your issue on Google. We all do it when we get an error message. Then your page is right there, or we all know the command K, control K, control F stuff. Um, it's very important that that's usable and accessible to everyone. Um, another thing is that I don't think there's like actually a one-size-fits-all solution. You really actually have to know your story, know your audience, uh, you know your audiences, um, and who's coming in. I don't think there's like anything worse than uh, making an assumption about who is reading the docs and what they want and. Uh, that not actually being like, this is not what I want. Like, why are you treating me as if I'm doing this? I think the best documentation I've ever written was like the Rust document, or not written, but read was like the Rust documentation. I read, went into it, and then the way that I explained like a lot of the very difficult concepts were just like so good. It made me, it made me feel seen. Like, I started crying <laughs> because it just like was so good and like just understood what people were coming in for. Yeah. yeah um Elin and Nat touched a very nice point, which is about assuming knowledge and making the documentation accessible. And Nat bringing in the, the Rust example is nice because Rust has um, this idea of like auto documentation. So documentation actually lives close to the code because whenever you're publishing a creation in Rust, you get the documentation published. So I think one very important part of documentation is that it needs to be up to date, which <laughs> unfortunately is not all. It's not something that. It's a given. It, it should be. Uh, it should be, but it's not always the case. So I think it's like one rule is uh, caring for the users. You, you how your user is going to use it. So um, if it's like an API or something like that, it needs to be easy to find. Needs to be accessible. 
uh, in a way that you're not assuming knowledge, you're being direct, and people can actually go in, find what they want, and go out. Needs to be updated uh, is also a very important thing, and you know, close to the code. Nonlinearity. Um, previously, when people would write documentation, you think of a book. Who, who, who remembers like having a book that really made something click for them? I mean, I, I actually learned uh, JavaScript after I learned Ruby because all the JavaScript books were written, written for people who had a CS degree. I did not, so I loved to learn with Ruby. But nowadays, people are a little different. Um, you can't just sit someone in front of the docs and be like, read all of this, and then you can get to hello world. Uh, but a lot of uh, the times when we think about documentation, we think about sitting someone at the beginning and then working their way to the end. But that's not how people learn. Uh, they, they don't want to spend necessarily two hours getting a uh, server set up just so that they can start playing with React code. And that, that was one of the things that people really struggled with with learning React was they had so many hurdles to jump over just to play with the code. And one of the things that we did to get around that uh, on React.dev was to make all the examples interactive. So you didn't have to spend time you know, wading through boilerplate to get spun up you could immediately see the impact and immediately start learning. And let's be honest, we're mostly working on brownfield projects, so who's really spinning up a site from scratch with React anymore? That's not a use case we need to teach you about. Uh, let's have Nat and Antagus, and then let's like, move on, because there's so much, so much going on. But do you want to go on that? Yeah, there's also the sense of like, trust and building up that trust. I think what you were saying about like, getting in early to like, something that you can do uh, making sure stuff is up to date because trust is very, very difficult to get and very easy to lose. Uh, and once you've done that, it's almost impossible to get it back. And people will just, uh, if your docs are wrong or if they lead people astray, then people won't trust you and they'll just watch YouTube videos to try to figure out what to do. Yeah, definitely about trust. Um, earned in drops, lost in buckets, right? Um, I, I wanted to also mention about good docs is docs that I don't feel compelled to stay on for too long. Um, I think someone was talking about um, you know, the measure of success of docs is users spend hours on this website. And I don't necessarily think that's true. And I, I don't, was, was it you? Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Rachel was talking about this. And um, you can't, if, if docs are good, you show up, you find what you need, you fix your thing, and you leave. Um, after, of course, you read the entire docs and you know the thing, right? Um, but it should be that discoverable. I think that's definitely also a tenet of, of good docs. Nice. I, you've shared so many different words, so many different. I wish there was a word cloud for all of the different things you brought. Uh, and, but people here, some of them work on documentation. Maybe they actually lead teams who are supposed to help plan documentation. Let's kind of take a step back, and someone who's been working for a company has been tasked with documentation. Where do they start? One thing I really like that you spoke about, you spoke about the knowing your audience. How do you cater to these? So if we, if we go back to the beginning, how do you go about architecting a good uh, set of documentation? What are the first things that come into your mind? And what are some of the first things you think about when it comes to the developers who are going to be interacting with it? Can I build upon your question a little bit? Because every time we've had to start docs, yes, that and um, there's always a discussion of we want to build the docs in a way that's going to scale over time and that we're not going to have to like rewrite this. And so there's always a discussion or quite often a discussion. Should we go with Gitbook or MDbook or should we Docusaurus? Like what, what do we use? How, what do we use that's going to scale? Um, Ilian, you have thoughts. But this is the discussion that keeps coming up and I think that builds on your question. So um, here you are. Well, the, the only thing that I was going to say is that you should use Starlight. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, to be honest, who, who has Ooh. read the Astro documentation? Not that many people. <laughs> All right. Well, it is very good, right? Yes. yes, yes. And Starlight is a framework that we built with all the knowledge of writing docs in Astro for Astro. And all of that knowledge we built into a framework which is very comparable to something like DocuSaurus. And a great tool will help you write great docs because you can do a lot with it. It will suggest what you have to do. And of course, you can take example of other documentation as well. I still look up Svelte documentation and check, hmm, they are doing this differently than I do. Is that something that we have to change? Is this a good approach? Um, and I think that's important to check out what everyone else is doing because it's open source. We all work together because we want a better web. We are not competitors. 
I, I love how you spoke about, like, there are tools out there. The same way we've listened and heard about so many tools to help with building React, right? There's so many tools to help build docs. And now, I remember when we asked people if they um, wrote documentation, not everyone put their hand up. Some people here, they, in their minds, write code. How can someone who's just writing code still have an effect? Not just writing code. How is someone who is writing awesome code uh, still have an effect uh, downstream on the people who are writing documentation or building documentation? When you're thinking and planning about documentation, what are some of the things you wish these engineers could be doing to help make your life easier? Um, I think uh, when you start thinking at Docs, it's, it, it becomes at ver the very first beginning, an exercise on empathy in the terms of you need to understand or you need to remember, perhaps, uh, how it was when you got started on that or how it was when you were thinking about that specific API and how would you explain that. So um, comes then, with that comes, comes as a given, uh, not assuming knowledge and being very explicit and intentional on uh, giving a certain set of snippets, perhaps, because then the snippet might not be the best way to explain something, but is a way to get somebody unstuck. And that's already a good point. If somebody sees progress, they're more likely to go back and check your docs and stuff like that. Uh, I see Rachel wants to. Uh, so at some companies like Amazon, they have this idea that you work from your press release backwards. And that makes sense if you're like releasing products. But what if you're re releasing code? The extreme format is to write from your documentation backwards. And this will help you actually catch some really interesting um, things like, wait a minute, why are we going to, that doesn't make sense in this API. I have difficulty over explaining it. Uh, but actually doing like a mini write up of how you would teach someone to use a new feature can be really helpful, not just for the people who will document it, but also for making sure that you're building the right thing and it actually would make sense to somebody who's trying to parse that knowledge from you. Um, but also, code comments help. Please comment your code, please. Yeah, um, I was going to say, well, it was more built upon what you said, but um, we actually are very lucky at Astro with our engineers. They're amazing, and they do a lot of documentation by themselves. But we provide them with templates. For instance, when we moved from Astro 2 to Astro 3, we built a template. In Astro 2, you did this. This is what we're doing in Astro 3. This is what you have to change. And that makes it very easy for us, because they fill in that template, and then we take that knowledge and we rewrite it so that it's good. And um, one of the things I also was going to say, um, one thing that I always keep in the back of my mind is that I imagine um, every user on my website being the most aggressive, annoyed people um, just because they, their framework isn't working. Why is it not working? So you want your information fast. You want everything like that. Um, and that's something that I always keep in mind. And I think that helps uh, to keep things short and concise and to the point. Um, other than that, you still have to make, well, to be a good voice. Um, we are very particular in the words that we use. Um, there was an issue open a couple of days ago on our doc site, which states, um, well, stated um, that we use the word, uh, word included. Uh, we did something including this and that, but it was only this and that. So that's a big word change. Um, and it's really important because you as a user will be frustrated if you want to use something else. And you can't find it in the docs because it's nowhere documented. Using that, changing that um, included to only will help a lot of users. And it's just one word. Um, so it's important. No, it's funny when you spoke about uh, imagining the person on your docs page being the most annoyed, angry person. I was like, yes, I've, I have, I have definitely, definitely been there as well. So you've spoken a little bit about how people who aren't writing docs can can help, how people who are writing docs can think about architecting it and kind of almost go from docs first rather than uh, kind of from press release first, and also making it easier for the developers to help contribute to the documentation as well. I know you folks have things that you're very, very passionate about as well, so you've kind of thinking about planning and stuff. How, and you spoke a lot about being inclusive and remembering different people. What are some tips or some things that you think are easy wins for people who are working on their docs that they can start to include? One thing that we um, really started doing is not including videos. Um, and we do that for a reason, because oh, they're not it. accessible. Um, whereas, of course, you can make videos as being um, built upon your docs or being an extra, but they shouldn't be the main thing, because they're not accessible. 
but it also, I watch videos as well. It's also much harder to update videos than to update text. I, and things being up to date earns trust. Someone once described um, uh, documentation as the food pyramid, and that like videos are right at the top the, with the chocolate and the cake. It's great, you love having it, but you shouldn't have a diet consisting only of that. Tejas, sorry, you were going to no, say something. I was also going to add, in the spirit of being inclusive and supportive of all people coming to the docs, I think a common mistake that I see in, in docs that could use some love is um, assuming knowledge, um, particularly even with the use of things like acronyms that maybe people don't know. Um, I think there's plenty of room to, the first time you use an acronym, just always, always expand it. Um, and also, there's tangential knowledge sometimes where you know you're starting to write a rabbit hole in your docs. Um, and what we've seen work really well there is add like call outs instead. So little block quotes that, that say, hey, this is just, just an aside. This is some adjacent knowledge, and if you want to learn more, click here, this link to the extra page. That has been quite useful. We'll go Nat, and then we'll go Rachel, and then we'll yep. go to Bob. Uh, like, I think inclusivity <laughs> is important, but I also feel like a lot of times people go the op complete opposite route and end up like kind of talking down to people. Yeah. Uh, like, that's another assumption that you assume, if you assume your uh, audience is to like complete baby programmer, now, now you have to add a div. Can you say div? D I V. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, like figure out a way to be inclusive, to be open to new people without, again, like if you're the most frustrated programmer and someone's saying like, let's do div, D I V, you're not going to be a happy camper with that. <laughs> you really have to know who your audience is. Uh, yeah. I remember working on the React Native docs. I ran user surveys. And I highly recommend, if you're working on docs, actually talk to the people who are using them. They're going to survive you. I mean, they're going to surprise you. They will survive your docs. Uh, I remember with React Native, for instance, one of the first things I did, because I used to be a UXer. So I've been a lot of things, which means I have a really big toolbox. So I was like, I don't know these mobile developers. I better get to know them. And I interviewed a bunch, and it turned out, and ran some surveys, turned out something like 60% of the people who visited React Native's documentation at any given time were not web developers. React was not the first thing they learned. They had to learn about JavaScript. They had to learn React. And how did we introduce React Native to them? So you know how to use React, right? React Native is like React on your mobile browser. <laughs> oh, man. And I wanted to, so first, like, know who you're writing for. Are they completely new to JavaScript? React Native team was like, why are you putting in so many links to MDN? JavaScript developers know this. I'm like, only 40% of the people visiting the site know these things. For the rest of them, they need MVN right now. Um, they don't understand JavaScript. They're disgusted by it. I'm sorry, it's true. <laughs> um, uh, they're like, I want to go back to SwiftUI now. <laughs> and we got to keep them there. But uh, that is one of the, the things that I think is helpful is meet the user, and build a style guide. Like, build some conventions in. We, for instance, uh, made it so that when you were talking about mobile platforms, you didn't just mobile native platforms. Never use the word native, because that offends people who spend all their time getting really good at iOS and Android development. So we'd always be like, iOS and Android. Android comes after to be polite, because it has the bigger audience. Um, or was it Android and iOS? I don't know. Check the style guide. We documented it, and it's right there in the readme, uh, in the repo. And then you can go on from that to create templates and help standardize the content to make it more approachable for people, and they can really understand different authors uh, writing in the same voice. And circling back to the language as well, in the terms of knowing your audience, there's also the, in terms of controlling your language, because sometimes in our eagerness to show like goodwill and show that we so that we, to retain the person we might use words like easy straightforward that's simple and stuff like that and that can like we need to exercise the, again the empathy on talking to the user about that might be easy to you but that's like there's a context into that and maybe that's not quite that and also like keep it keep the hat of the educator when writing the content sometimes we're eager to show that our product's great or our solution is amazing and we are very it's very clear for us that that's a great idea but we need to we need to 
put on the educator, explain why, and not make assumptions, not make decisions, and let people make up their minds. And imagine like the kind of wording you're using and how you're trying to relate to this uh, to your reader in terms of yeah, if you're saying something simple, how would you feel if you don't achieve something simple on the first go? Um, that can put people off, and that can be very frustrating. And I don't know, maybe people don't want to use that anymore because if that makes them feel bad about themselves. So um, I think that's also something to take care of. So, and it needs to be explicitly said, like Tejas already mentioned the acronyms. Acronyms are like, don't assume knowledge, use acronyms. There's like a very nice uh, yeah, anecdote about using an acronym in a different context, like I don't know, JWT, maybe JSON Web Tokens, or maybe Java Web Toolkit. Sometimes I, I have very strong opinions about both of those, and they're not quite the same. But anyway, so that's that. Like, be explicit about what you're trying to say, and don't put opinions on people's heads. Let them make your own decisions. Um, one of the things, I strongly agree with what you said, um, very strongly. Um, but it's very hard to do, right? Um, even if you're writing docs, if you're reading docs, it's very difficult. Um, so we did docs for docs. We have a full documentation website on how to write documentation uh, for Astro. Um, of course, I work full time um, on documentation, but we also have a lot of contributions from the community. How do you make sure that they also can follow those rules? Well, that's where our contributor guides come in, for instance. Um, I pinged Attila once to write some documentation about using Astro with Zeta. Um, and he could read that documentation, it's there for him, and by doing that, he severely like, trims down the time that I need to spend to make sure that it's reviewed, that it's good, and it's final. Um, so yeah, documentation about documentation is a thing. We'll do Tejas and then that, and then we'll move on to the next question. And then we're going to get to the audience questions. Remember, and I know some people already ask questions, remember to just go on there and then on a the thread underneath, tell us if you're online or you're in person, just so we know who to throw the microphone to. All right. My, um, what I wanted to add was just a question, actually, um, about knowing your users. Because I, I apologize if this is the wrong number, but you mentioned 40% of React Native folks didn't know or didn't come from the JavaScript background. 60 Six, okay, how how did how was that measured? And I'm wondering if we can extract like, um, you know, tools that we can use to measure who comes to our docs and so on. Great question, Tejas. Uh, the best way to figure these things out is to ask people, real people, preferably in front of you. But that would be a lot of one-on-ones. I don't have time for that. Uh, typically, uh, I will do about 10 interviews with community members to form a set of questions that I want to ask the greater community, and then surveys. And specifically, surveys on the part of the site that the people you want to talk to are using. I want to hear about people who are using documentation, so the survey goes on the doc site, not the marketing site, not on Reddit, not in other forums where people might not be using docs, but right there where my user is. So yeah, I just asked them, and they told me. And you know what? Some people were learning React Native, something like 10%, as their first foray into programming. I know, right? We added a, a much longer on-ramp for those who wanted it. Uh, just one thing I wanted to add is uh, do not, under any circumstances, let your marketing department touch your docs. <laughs> marketing driven de marketing driven development is like the worst idea, especially relating to like trust. Again, uh, it's like if you're trying to learn how to solve something, you sh there should not be an interstitial saying, "Would you like to learn how to do how to do this? Upgrade to Gatsby Cloud to." <laughs> Figure out how to uh, how to do your thing. Like again, like if you're the most uh, angry programmer trying to figure something out, you don't want to uh, make someone think that they're trying to sell you something instead of informing you how to do it. Thank you. It's been great to hear all of the different ways that you, as the people building the documentation, can create better documentation and the kind of the different ways that we can adapt to our audience as well. Um, I think a final question for me before we move on to the, audience, uh, to the audience questions is how do we, as the people who are consuming documentation, the engineers, how do we get involved and how do we help to contribute to better documentation? I have a very strong opinion on this, and um, it's called translations. It's very easy. You all know a language, and it might not be your first language, uh, well, being English. Um, and if your docs is translated, like an Astro, we have uh, 14 languages. 
So yours is probably in them. Um, so for instance, we have our docs translated for 100% to Spanish and um, to Chinese, I think, tra traditional Chinese. Um, and then 10 other languages that we have partially. And those are all contributed. And you learn the framework by translating it uh, because you are busy reading the docs, you translate it, so it goes to your mind a couple of times. Um, so I think that's very first uh, good contribution that's easy and very accessible. Do the surveys. Do the surveys if you are using documentation. Do, do leave the feedbacks. You know, the thumbs up and the thumbs down if something didn't work. You know, leaving the feedback definitely helps. I was, I was thinking Nat was going to follow up on the translation comment there. But, uh, yes, translations are good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so it's interesting because not all docs are open sourced in a way that people can contribute to. Astro is special because there's this great team of open source contributors, and they're hustling, and you've got Sarah organizing them, and I, I admire it. It's so cool. But then you've got more commercial interests where you can't really go out and be like, hello, people. You have free time. Would you like to write our docs for us? Because we did not feel like hiring technical writers. That's a no-no. Uh, open source projects deserve your time. Give the open source projects your time. But also, Open source projects need someone to organize their documentation. And if you're wondering how you can help your favorite open source project, doing, taking a, a leaf from Astro's notebook and actually being the person to be like, I will organize the docs. I will write the style guide. I will find people to contribute. And I will learn about information architecture so that the navigation is comprehensible. Yeah. That is a really good thing that you can do. You can take the lead on this and evangelize documentation in your community and at your workplace. We'll have Tejas, and then we'll jump into audience questions. No, I was just going to be really short and mention that when you touch the docs on anything, you are impacting the lives of thousands. You said this to me earlier. Rachel said this. You're Millions. impacting the lives of thousands of developers. And it's, it's a tremendous impact. Um, and that's why you know, it needs to be taken as seriously. And that's why we're having these discussions. So. Just one last note. There's one piece of documentation that all of you have definitely used and can use translations, and that's actually how I started the first time, which is MDN. Uh, so MDN accepts yeah. translations, and everybody uses, everybody uses. My, one of my first contributions was to that. I came like, I was an intern, and I went there and said, yeah, I was in Brazil. I said, I know English. I can translate to Portuguese, but I don't know JavaScript. The reaction was, I know JavaScript and I don't know English, so we can sit together and do it together. So I learned a lot from JavaScript like that, and I definitely urge you to do something like that. If you don't have an open source project that you use, you can always go back to MDN, because that's what all of us use. And yeah. All right, let's jump into some audience questions. Do you want to tell me which one the first one is? Yes, so I've got from Glenn Reyes. Is Glenn Reyes in the room? Yes, there he is. One of our speakers, get ready to catch. Tom Brady this, Tom Brady this. There we go. I've got, I've got a, an assist. No one was hurt. <laughs> okay. um, that's a microphone. Oh, cool. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, let me read my question. I forgot what I asked. So it was uh, like a half an hour ago. Uh, So yeah, do you have any thoughts or tips on automating documentation within the source code? So things like commenting or JS docs? For APIs, absolutely. If your API is GraphQL, or um, if it's a REST API specified with something like OpenAPI or Swagger, um, there's plenty of tools, some open source created by friends of ours, who that, that will do that. That will, um, through your YAML annotations and a Swagger documentation or whatsoever, um, generate a docs website for you with um, code snippets and the likes. Those are open source on GitHub. I'm not going to point you to a specific repo, um, but in the case of concretely typed APIs, like with OpenAPI or GraphQL, yes. Um, in terms of generating docs from just code bases, I've seen that done with JS Doc, as you mentioned. Um, but outside of that, I haven't, I haven't seen anything. Curious. We at Astro, we, we do it. Um, we do it for our um, CLI generation um, and our error messaging. Our error messaging uh, documentation gets generated out of the actual code. So yeah, it's possible. Awesome. All right, let's go to the next question. The next Shruti? one. We have Shruti, who's also one of our speakers. Speakers love speaking <laughs> and asking questions. Please don't hurt Shruti. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, okay, what are some examples of companies writing stellar documentation? Sorry, I 
Astro. <laughs> React, to be honest, React, do, well, not, of course, if, are you looking for companies, like real companies? Yeah. Um, Stripe. <laughs> you said, said good company documentation, right? Yeah. Uh, Stripe stocks are amazing. True. They really set the bar, uh, it, at least until the React documentation came along. <laughs> <laughs> nice. To be honest, I don't look a lot at companies' documentation, actually. So, I'm not the one to speak on this. Fair enough. All right, next we have, do you mind reading out the username? Uh, mm -hmm. Coca, Coca Ran Nikita? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> How do we pronounce that username? Kulkarni, that's my last ah, name. Kulkarni. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you, how do you all handle like big version changes documentation? For example, what Next.js went through, right? Like with one version to the other, there are so many different changes. How do you get the community to sort of adopt those changes and how do you handle documentation? Because I feel like um, it's a very tricky place to be in general. I have ideas, but I want to like We've got a lot of people who've been managing uh, version changes up here. Yeah, well, th that's what I said earlier. Like, how we do it is we give the developers a template. That's what helps. Um, the thing is you have to do it right from the start because it's very difficult to catch up on something like that because your users will need documentation that's updated. But isn't Astro also marking like new features based on version? So then if there's like yep. a major change, and the new feature showed up. There's like this little tag saying, "Oh, this thing is new." And yeah, stuff yeah. Like that. Then the the version is right right on top, so you have like on it, the version needs to be explicit, especially if there's a change, right? So um, it like I think the point is being right there, where there's like a nice quote about this UX guys uh, don't make the user think. So if this is an information that's relevant for the user, it needs to be close by. And then, if it's an API and the API is version, it does is not that much real estate that's going to occupy by making the, the version there. And then, if you can add like a UX, uh, a, UX a UX point is actually allowing them to change versions. That's something that is being done, for example, on, on the Tauri docs that uh, the company I work at, Crab Nebula, does a lot of uh, Tauri work. Tauri is the open source uh, framework for building native applications. and. On version two, there's going to be a lot of changes because there's more support. So the docs are kind of separate and it's going through a big overhaul. So making the version very explicit is nice. All right. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind here. React Native stocks. Uh, React, I don't know if, it, if you've noticed, it's, uh, it doesn't change very often. It has a very small API surface. And for a long time, it existed, if you remember the old docs, it's a series of code essays. And it, it sort of... Uh, yeah, half the documentation was on Dan's blog. The other half was buried under a navigational item. Like, their hooks were documented in four different places. It was all over the place. But then with React Native, React Native is still in version zero. Zero point, I don't know what, I think it's like 70 something or whatever. And when I got there, it was like in the 20s. I don't remember. But the point is, it versions. It always versions. Uh, DocuSource has built in versioning Astro as well uh, at Starlight. Not yet. It's coming. It's coming. Anyway, versioning is difficult to do. If you don't have a versioning system, it's like one of the harder challenges to build for docs. You can speckle evergreen docs with little notes about like, oh, in version 18, this was deprecated. But the problem with that is eventually your documentation just becomes like a patchwork of, yeah, but on version 15, we thought this was a really good idea. Uh, I like DocuSaurus's uh, way of doing it, which is like you make a cold press of the docs, and they kind of go into like static file mode in the bottom of a Glacier server somewhere, and only the number of versions that you still support are still active and can be edited and marked down, because there's a build cost to that. So you got to pick, like, do you want to create like cutting new versions of the docs every time you version the code, or are you going to do with a patchwork? evergreen style, which eventually becomes unmaintainable. You want to solve versioning er early, is what I'm trying to say. And that's why you should just pick something that works and goes with it. But the other thing, remember, think about your user. Think about the person who's going to consume this. 
you, you know, how are they going to think about their old code and migrate to the new code? You want, you want to add, just as you might have migration guides from uh, one framework to another, you want to add upgrade guides. Every new version should come with a complete set of upgrades and new concepts that are being explained in the paradigm of the old. We'll do that, and then we'll go on to some online questions as well. Yeah, so uh, this is like more of a general engineering thing, but if you're making changes that require like explanation, make them actually changes that people want to make. Because uh, like no matter how you tell the story, if it's just like if people feel, if people feel like that's just like churn or if just they don't understand it, then no amount of good documentation is gonna like change that. So. Nice. I love like a kind of the consensus is you really need to plan and think about this versioning from early on. So we have another question coming in from online. Hey, online, how are you? Hey, online. So we did have a question that was about um, how to do versioning well, and I think we've touched on that a little bit, but maybe we can come back to that if we've got time. So we'll do another question, which is from Ketch. Oh, no, sorry. Online, Rhea. Thoughts or tips on documenting a legacy app without any kind of documentation? Is it worth it? How would you approach it? I mean, you can feed the source code into chat GPT and go, please. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I, I love the way Rachel was just like, yeah, no, <laughs> I am not answering that question. Um, and then from somebody else, it's just a number. What has more value, docs, well docs or well-written unit slash integration tests that describe what the code does? Uh, so, show of hands, how many here of you start a project by reading the unit tests? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I need one. to answer that one, but for in case you online couldn't see it, there were three hands raised. Uh, maybe, what? We already know, that's the entire room. Uh, okay, then for, for, for <clears throat> proprietary, sorry, pro <clears throat> raise your hands if you uh, start a new project by reading its docs. Yeah, significantly more. There we go. <laughs> All right. We are nearly out of time, so we'll have one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Is there one more? Yes. Um, do you want to pick one? Uh, let's, let's do it in order of the ones that came in. That one? Yeah. Uh, Mara, who is in person. Mara, do you mind waving at us so we can see where you are? Yes. Um, yes, I had a question about uh, the uh, discussion seems to be relating to product um, companies writing mostly docs for technical users. Um, how does the writing translate to an uh, agency model that has a bunch of projects running in parallel? Um, is the docs then responsibility of the agency or like the client? I used to work at agencies and they did not document things. But one theory I have is that agencies could have their own uh, in-house documentation team that specifically exists to create that uh, you know, baseline, style guide, uh, boilerplate documentation, and, and templates. It really can be uh, productionized in that regard. And it's something I would actually like to see more, not just agencies, but investment firms do. If you have a crack team of people who are great at teaching and really have solid opinions about how to build documentation, you can totally have them maintaining multiple projects and taking what they've implemented and done so well on one project to the next. So that is my hope. Cool. Do you want to add? OK, so we, we are out of time. One quick fire question. You spoke about some great examples that you really, really liked. Just one word, the name of a place where people can go to check for docs experiences that are really, really good. We'll just go along. It may be one. It may be your own one that you're working on. Could be any. Feel free. <laughs> Astro. <laughs> Easy. I don't know if we're going in order, but in, in case we're not, Astro absolutely has Astro the best well. docs I've seen nice. in, in, in recent times. Yeah, I'll, I'm not going to repeat Starlight. That's like a, the Astro template for docs, so if you're looking for But I'll also add that it's, uh, it's nice also to have some kind of automation like chain, for change logs and stuff like that. So I would add there's a, I totally escaped the name, the change set from Apply. Yeah. Change sets is good if you're managing a library or something that has multiple releases. It's also good to keep up-to-date change logs so you can even automate that with the releasing 
So that's important. That's also documentation, and that's really good. Well, I, I just agreed. That's it. Um, and good documentation. Well, there is a couple. Astro, of course, and <laughs> Starlight, and of course the Astro Docs Docs. Um, well, they're still being written, but it's a documentation on how we did documentation, and it's also very good documentation. Nice. I really like the TypeScript docs. Uh, I, I would say React Native's docs, I mean, sorry, React's docs at react.dev, but I can't commit to that right now because, uh, I mean, I know that the best is yet to come. Uh, Clerk's docs team, by the way, is hiring if you, wanna, if you want to go make the best docs in the world. So uh, I have to vote there. Cool. Thank you so much to our wonderful panel. Give them one more round of applause. We really appreciate them. <laughs>